Uh, welcome to the talk on MIDI 2.0. Uh, and we have Mike Kent, who is a synth geek and independent consultant, and Florian Bomers, who uh, founded Bohm Software and focuses on MIDI translation. And we also have Brett Porter, who uh, is from Art and Logic, talking about MIDI 2.0. Thank you, thank you. Just, uh, this is evidence for my wife. Someone wants to hear what I have to say? All right. Uh, so MIDI 2.0 uh, is coming soon to an environment near you. Uh, how many people were in, uh, at ADC and, and watched MIDI presentations last year here? Some, a, li a little bit of this, just at the top, is a little bit of review to bring uh, about half the room up to speed on what was presented last year. So that's the first section, recap. Then we look at some of the new features and also um, some of the current prototyping and development that's going on right now. All right, so as uh, he said, that's me. Okay, so here's, here's from the MIDI Manufacturers Association, a very clear and concise thing that I was appointed to say. MIDI 2.0 specifications are nearing completion. They have not been adopted by the MIDI Manufacturers Association. Details are subject to change before adoption. All right, there's our disclaimer out of the way. Um, okay, so MIDI capability inquiry is the first uh, foundation of MIDI 2.0. And the fundamental idea is that if two devices agree, then we can do new things with MIDI. If two devices say, hey, do you do the, the, the new things? And the, and the guy answers, yes, great. If it's no, you just continue to use MIDI 1.0 as we've always done, uh, no change. And so this, the, the, the foundation uh, specification is called MIDI CI. MIDI CI has three Ps in it, uh, profile configuration, property exchange, and protocol negotiation. So on top of each of these, there are additional specifications. MIDI CI uh, has already been released and we're about to release an update to MIDI CI. And we're also about to uh, release these uh, specifications that sit on top of it. So there's a common rules for, for MIDI CI profiles. Uh, there's a common rules for property exchange. And then above these core specifications in the dark blue, these are applications at the top. Uh, and those specifications are, are in development, but. Uh, uh, will take some years to, to roll out all of those various application specifications. There's a whole lot of room for expansion to follow. Uh, then for a protocol, uh, there's the new Universal MIDI packet, which is a, a, a format for presenting MIDI data, uh, and the, uh, the new MIDI 2 protocol with the, the new messages. So we're presenting all of, all of these three Ps this morning, uh, starting off with uh, the area of profiles. So profile is auto configuration. Two devices agree to use a predetermined set of messages. So what does that do for us? So if we consider the case of a drawbar organ, um, we've seen, you know, many of us have seen a Hammond organ. It's got nine drawbars on it. Here's three different drawbar organs, and none of them uh, potentially use the same messages to control the nine drawbars. So by introducing a profile, a device can say to another device, what profiles do you understand? And that other device at the other end will say, I understand the organ profile. And then the, each device can switch to using that profile, and then drawbar number 16 is using a common message for all three of these devices um, across all manufacturers. So we, uh, through MIDI CI, we ask the question, do you support the drawbar organ profile? And then we enable it once we find out that the, the device is uh, supporting it. There's a number of different uh, profiles uh, coming and, and three different uh, main profile types. The first one is instrument profiles. So all acoustic pianos have very similar uh, uh, traits, and so we can draw write a, a profile specification for a piano or an organ or electric pianos, drum sets, and so on. So these are instrument profiles. We expect to develop profiles for all kinds of effects. And then feature profiles. Uh, orchestral articulation, for example, is the first list here, first on the list. That might be common to different uh, types of synthesizers. 
Uh, or, or maybe something like uh, a pitch profile where you understand microtonal tuning or something like that. So these are feature profiles. So three different types of profiles that allow this auto configuration. A DAW could, could ask a, a synthesizer, what profiles do you do? And then automatically configure and map uh, controllers for that type of uh, profile. That's the, the goal there. Property Exchange does the same kind of auto configuration, but yet a deeper level. We lost signal. Should I swap to this other dongle here? It's back for now. I'll keep this one handy. Um, all right. Uh, why is it doing that to me? Sorry, I'm not sure why it's not advancing. That is stuck up there. I'm gonna have to, I think I'm gonna unplug and I'm gonna switch to this other. Display. Video, who needs it? Audio doesn't do, this doesn't happen with audio. All right. I think I'm back. All right, so property exchange. Property exchange, and it's gone away again. It doesn't like this slide. Okay, this one's working, so we're gonna skip the last slide. <laughs> uh, Property Exchange uh, does uh, auto configuration and discovers information about devices. Uh, it's a get and set type of mechanism and it uses uh, MIDI CI messages, which are system exclusive, with a payload that is JSON data. And we can use it to get uh, details out of a device that are not necessarily MIDI properties, but they're properties of the device in how I use MIDI. And so they're not MIDI messages like note on and so on. It's tell me what MIDI channel you're on, give me a list of the programs in the device and how I recall them with bank, bank select, what categories uh, do they belong to and so on. Uh, uh, so there's also a subscribe mechanism, get, set, subscribe are, are fundamental mechanisms. Um, and the idea is just allowing easier configuration. So you could ask a device even for a JSON schema of, of, of some properties that it has. Um, you could even generate a, a GUI from, for, for the device to edit it using property exchange without having to build a custom editor. All right, so this is what a, a message transaction would look like. Uh, first, a device makes an inquiry, and you'll see there, there that the header says resource uh, device info. And device info is, is the target that we're, that we're asking of the device uh, in this get message. And then there's a reply for, from there is, um, is shown there in the bottom part of the screen. There's a header with a status, um, and then there's the actual data. And so you can see several properties that all relate to fundamental device information. So this is, this is a, a simple example of how property exchange works. I tell you what I'm asking for and you send it back to me in this format. Before you actually get to do that, you probably wanna know what can I ask you? And so we've defined a, something called resource list. So when I say get resource list, a device will answer with a payload that looks something like this. And there are four properties that come back here that are resources that are available that are standardized resources. You'll notice the second one is can subscribe equals true. So that's one where not only can I get and set it, but I can subscribe to it so that if, if updates happen on that property uh, or that data set, the uh, receiver is gonna inform me, hey, something changed and tell me what changed. So that's subscription. Um, and so, uh, the, the fifth one that's on there is a little bit unique. Most of these resources, uh, the default is JSON, but some resources that you want to retrieve from a device may not be JSON. In that case, you have to declare the media type of what your reply is. And so this particular resource, which is called buffer state, it's a dump of, of what's in my buffer memory at the moment. So it's just a, a, a raw block of data. And so it comes back and declares a media type, um, which in this case is de declared as an octet stream, and it's encoded in mcoded7, which is the name for, that we have assigned to taking 
what's normally 8-bit bytes and putting them into 7 bits. So 8 bytes, uh, or, or seven, 7 bytes take up 8 bytes to transmit using this M-coded 7. There's also optional compression using Zlib as well. Or Zlib, I'm in the UK, sorry. Um, all right, so these are the, the fundamental ideas of, of property exchange. We start by asking uh, for a resource list, then we know what we can ask of the device, and it answers back with the, the payload uh, corresponding to what you've uh, asked for. Now we're gonna try playing a video with sound, which we didn't get to test. Let's see how this works. Nope. All right, we can skip that too. It wasn't very good, really. Uh, okay, so we're gonna move on from there to talk about protocol negotiation and the protocol. Isn't that nice? I'm gonna unplug this. Plug back in again. Get your laptop ready, we might switch to yours. You, you have the presentation on yours? I just wonder if... Video. This is not working. Let's, let's switch to yours if we will. Okay. It's gonna take a minute for Florian to get the presentation up on his computer. Okay. What happens if I go like that? Do you have a good signal yet? You should have it now. You don't have clean, oh, that looks good to me. Let's press play and see what happens. Okay, we, maybe it's, I don't know, it was the same image we, we had problems with before, so let's see what happens now. Okay, we'll skip that slide, it wasn't very good either. <laughs> All right, um, okay, so protocol negotiation, uh, using MIDI CI, two devices with this bi-directional connection say, how about we use the new protocol, the MIDI 2.0 protocol with its extended messages? And if the two agree, then you switch, and that's followed by a test. If that test fails, then both devices revert back to MIDI 1.0. Always wanting to protect the integrity of MIDI 1.0 and, and at least have, have MIDI functionality uh, at, at that level. All right, so what is MIDI 2.0 protocol? Uh, it's more MIDI. It uses the existing semantics and mechanisms of MIDI 1.0, so you'll still find there's a node on and a node off with velocity and there are controllers and program change and so on. Um, and backwards compatibility was really kept high in our priority list as we developed these new messages. Um, and so they're generally extended messages of the existing messages as well as some new messages. So higher resolution uh, data is generally 32-bit data in these new messages. There are more channels, uh, more controllers, and uh, for musical expression, is, is uh, this per note controller uh, area is a great new expansion of MIDI, uh, in MIDI 2.0. And per note pitch band, of course. Uh, articulation control. Uh, so we can put articulation data in a note. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Um, expanded tuning capabilities for microtuning and more. Uh, simpler messages for NRPN and RPNs. Who has used NRPNs and RPNs? A few people. Don't you hate them? Okay, they're being replaced with much simpler to use uh, equivalents. Uh, instead of sending four messages to get one piece of data through, we only have to send one message to get one piece of data through. It's fantastic. Um, all right, timestamps. Um, Let's move on. So we've introduced uh, these new messages by way of a new data format. That's the universal MIDI packet. And uh, so everything is in 32-bit words. And so we can have messages. Uh, here you'll see a couple of examples of 32-bit, and the, the bottom one is a 64-bit message. Uh, everything is in these, these packet formats as opposed to the previous byte stream from MIDI 1.0. and Every universal MIDI packet has three uh, initial fields. The first one is message type. 
is kind of a category field. We'll take a look at that next. Then there's a group, which is uh, addressing an expansion of channels. And then the status uh, byte from MIDI 1.0 is, is, is in here. That's, that's basically your opcode in MIDI, right? Uh, so let's take a look at the first of these fields, the message type. Uh, we defined, uh, it's, it's one nibble, so there are 16 message types, and we've defined the first five of them. Uh, MIDI's been around for 35 years, and we've added a bunch of stuff with MIDI 2.0. All the things that we really wanted are there, using up five message types. And so there's a lot of expansion space left uh, for uh, future messages to be added here. Uh, you'll notice that there's a, a fixed size, even for the reserved message types that are unused right now. This is so that we could build transports and send any of those new messages in the future and not have to redesign the transport. The transport can be designed now to understand that message type, uh, let's see, zero, uh, uh, zero, type C is a 96-bit message. Okay, so uh, some future proofing there in the message type. So MIDI 1.0 can be put into the universal MIDI packet and be sent over, over the same transports as MIDI 2.0, and it uses three message types to do so. Uh, one covers your system real-time and system common messages. Another one is a data message, and fundamentally that means our system exclusive messages are in there. And there's, there's a message type for our channel voice messages. That's all the things that are channelized, like note on and note off, and controllers, program change, after touch, and so on. So MIDI 1.0 is covered with, uh, with these three message types. MIDI 2.0 shares a couple of those. The system real-time and system common messages are identical between MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0 protocols. The data messages for system exclusive are identical between uh, MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0 protocols. The difference is when we come to the channel voice messages. Uh, the channel voice messages in MIDI 1.0 are in 32-bit packets, and the MIDI 2.0 channel voice messages are in 64-bit pa uh, packets, so we can fit more information in there. You can um, use MIDI 1.0 and MIDI uh, 2.0 on the same transport, but you can't mix uh, MIDI 1.0 channel voice messages and MIDI 2.0 channel voice messages within a group. We're going to get to a group in a moment and talk about groups. But within one group, you can choose to use either the MIDI 1.0 protocol or the MIDI 2.0 protocol, and MIDI CI is how you negotiate which one you're going to use. There's also a couple of new um, uh, message types. Uh, one is utility messages, uh, and in here you'll find a new op and uh, a no op and jitter reduction timestamps are here as well. So we are adding timestamps, and Florian's going to tell us a little bit about how those work in a, in a couple minutes. And then we have new data messages, SysX8 and mixed data messages. So these can be used by MIDI 2.0. They can also be used by a MIDI 1.0 device that's connected by UMP. So if you've got a device that's um, using uh, basically MIDI 1.0 protocol, we can now extend that and add those jitter reduction timestamps even on uh, a MIDI 1.0 uh, system, as long as we're using this universal MIDI uh, packet. All right, let's move on to talk about the next field in the UMP, that's the groups field. Groups is a multiplier for our channels. We still have 16 channels, but now we have 16 groups of 16 channels. And so a total of 256 channels. Uh, each group has those 16 channels plus its own set of system messages. And e the protocol on each group is negotiated independently. So on group one, I could have um, a MIDI 1.0 device, and on group two, have a MIDI 2.0 device, and then group three and four would be MIDI 1.0 devices, and so on. Each group has its own negotiation for which protocol is currently in use on that group. So when we connect to MIDI 1.0 systems, a group's roughly equivalent to a virtual cable or a port in MIDI 1.0's uh, architecture. So let's take a look at, at actual messages. Uh, this is a channel voice messages. And uh, on the top, we've got a MIDI 1.0 channel voice message in a 32-bit uh, universal MIDI packet. And so we see the message type field followed by the four bits of group. And then there's the 
uh, one status byte. Now the, the first uh, bit is still zero, just, just like it is when it's in that, that uh, byte stream. And then we've got the two data bytes following. So it's MIDI 1.0, uh, and we're just prepending one byte on the, on the beginning with the message type and the group field as well. In, in the MIDI 2.0 protocol, we expand that. So, you, so um, we've got a 16-bit index field and then 32 bits worth of data. So let's take a look at that as it relates in a note on message. In the note on message, um, the velocity that exists in the MIDI, uh, MIDI 1 note on becomes a 16-bit field. These are nice now, now nice round numbers, not seven-bit data. And then we've added two new fields in a note on. The first one is attribute type, and the second one is uh, attribute data. And so the 16 bits of attribute data allows me to put in new information about the node on. This could be articulation data. So for example, if I'm using this to control a string section, this is where I might encode whether this node is supposed to be played uh, pizzicato or spiccato or arco strings. Um, uh, articulation data can go into here. Uh, or you might also put pitch data into there. Uh, I have an example. I think the next uh, slide is an example of using this for pitch. So I would set the attribute type to type number three, which we've defined as uh, something we call pitch 7.9. And then in the 16-bit uh, data field that's available for that attribute, we have a, seven bits of tuning data that are semitones, referenced exactly the way they are with note on uh, in MIDI 1.0, and then six, uh, nine bits of fractional semitone. And so we can get very fine tuning and put that in the do into the note. So we can, we can do things to control the pitch much better than we can in MIDI 1.0. Uh, as you know, you know, most MIDI instruments just use equal temperament. This allows us to override equal temperament and do some cool things. If you're a musician, uh, I'll give you an example. You're playing a C major chord that goes to an F chord. And in between, you're going to put in a C augmented chord. So that G is going to go to a G sharp, and it's pulling towards the A in the F chord, right? Um, and so if I make that G sharp just a little bit sharper by using this pitch and push it up, that augmented chord pulls even harder towards that F. I might do the same on the E, so it's pulling towards the F as well. So I think there's a lot of composers who are going to love to play with this kind of pitch control in their notes and the, uh, and the actual tuning of chords in, in their compositions. All right, so that's using it for pitch. Now, this is an instantaneous thing on, on, the, on the note on, just like velocity. It's not something that you can change after you've set it, right? You set the pitch, and it's done once, and that's it. The note continues to sound however it sounds from there on. But we know that there are instruments where pitch is much more fluid than that. And so if you want to control pitch in a way that, that moves, you would use a per note controller. We've introduced uh, per note controllers in MIDI 2.0, and they have uh, you know, a note number and then an index, which tells you uh, there are 256 registered per note controllers. There are also 256 what we call assignable. Registered are predefined by the MIDI Manufacturers Association and AME, um, and uh, assignable are free to use however you'd like to use them. And one of them is defined as pitch 7.25. And so in controller number three, I get to put in seven bits worth of semitone and then this very, very fine increment of, of tuning of um, 25 bits uh, uh, as a fraction of a semitone. And that's a controller. So it can move up and down and, and, and play with the pitch of a note through the whole life of that note. And every note in the scale has its own per note pitch controller like that. All right. We have registered and assignable controllers at the channel level as well, and these are the replacement of RPN and NRPN. In translation, they translate back directly to RPN and, and NRPNs. So we have 16,384 registered and 16,384 assignable that you can use for anything you want. And they're all 32-bit data. So this is, this is just as easy to use as a control change message we have today. It's just one message, and uh, you can ramp that data as much as you like. I'm going to introduce Florian. Uh, Florian's going to come up and continue to discuss with you 
the features. I've taken a look at the messages. He's going to look at, at things that are a little bit more mechanism oriented in the MIDI 2.0 protocol. Yeah. Sorry, there's no notes. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Is it on? Thanks, Mike. <coughs> so, uh, yes, I'll uh, show you our MIDI 2 features. <coughs> so, um, the first uh, important new feature is uh, timestamps, um, which we call JR timestamps for jitter reduction. So they have a very limited scope. They're only there for jitter reduction, um, basically to improve timing. Um, as with all MIDI 2 features, um, you first need to do MIDI CI negotiation to find out if both um, MIDI devices understand timestamps and if they want to use timestamps, or if the user says, okay, I need to use timestamps, um, then they switch into timestamp mode, <coughs> uh, which means uh, that it uses the clock message to regularly tell the other MIDI device what your current time is. And every um, normal MIDI message is then prepended with a timestamp message. I'll show you in a second. Uh, the clock message is regularly sent um, by the sender to the receiver um, and update the current time. It's always the sender time. So um, the sender has its own clock and regularly tells the receiver about it. And of course, the receiver is also a sender. So it sends its own clock uh, to, to, the, uh, to the sender and tells it about its uh, own clock. So uh, there are two clocks, and uh, every receiver is responsible for maintaining sort of uh, a notion of what the other party's clock is. <clears throat> uh, the resolution is one, uh, three, 30, 31, 250th of a second. Has anybody heard that number before? Anyone seen it? Well, we thought it would be <laughs> funny to use that uh, Resolution. It's a uh, MIDI one bit rate um, on a on a DIN MIDI DIN transport. Uh, it one tick has a le defined length of 32 microseconds, so it's a it's a wall clock time. Uh, it's not a musical clock, um, but you can use it to very fine grained uh, uh, synchronization of two MIDI devices. <coughs> Uh, then the timestamp message is prepended to every MIDI message um, and tells the receiver about the current time of the following message. message. Uh, and I show you, show you an example. Um, the first um, example is a 32-bit um, MIDI message prepended by a uh, timestamp message. And the second one is a MIDI 2.0 64-bit message with a timestamp prepended. <clears throat> so finally, uh, even on uh, slower um, connections or um, jittery uh, connections, you can still have rock solid timing uh, with this jittery re reduction timestamp. Um, as Mike has pointed out, um, the UMP packet also um, has system real time and system common messages. They are exactly the same as in MIDI 1.0. Um, so you can do song select, MIDI timing clock, and, and all of that, uh, just as in MIDI 1.0 with the same messages. Um, of course, we want to keep compatibility. Um, what is interesting, as you can see here, um, you can send the MIDI timing clock. And if you use uh, JR timestamps, um, it's actually a very good combination, because then your musical timing clock, MIDI, uh, MIDI clock, um, has higher accuracy, accuracy with JR timestamps. <coughs> um, the UMP packet doesn't only have uh, all the MIDI 1.0 system messages, but also has room for uh, new messages to be defined in future, if we need any, any of those. System exclusive also exists in, um, in, in the UMP packet. Um, as UMP 
is uh, a packet. We need to packetize the arbitrary length uh, system exclusive message. So um, what we've done to do that is it's chunked and um, every chunk has a status uh, field which tells you is it the, the, the first chunk or a, a middle chunk or the last chunk of that system exclusive message. Uh, you can also send very short system exclusive messages in just one UMP packet. And all these system exclusive mm, packets are 64 bits, just like all other um, currently defined uh, channel voice messages in UMP. However, we thought, um, and probably most of you who have ever worked with system exclusive, that using seven bit data is kind of awkward and creates a lot of problems if you want to send um, computer data, eight bit style data. So um, we've added system exclusive eight, which is the exact same as, system, as the MIDI 1.0 system exclusive, but allows you to use eight bit data. So um, it's only available in UMP, but once um, a device speaks UMP, you can leverage uh, finally sending 8-bit uh, uh, system exclusive data. And if you need to send a little bit more than that, um, like files or even gigabytes of videos, I don't know what, um, there's a mixed data set message. It uses 128-bit um, packets, so it's more efficient than um, system exclusive 8. Um, it's, it's also always uh, manufacturer dependent, so it has a manufacturer ID field. Um, it's, it's chunked um, and um, provides some other facilities that um, make it a very po powerful tool, but it's a bit more complicated to use. Um, and, um, well, we will see what um, people will, will, may, will use it for. <laughs> As said, a very important part of MIDI 2.0 is um, backwards compatibility with uh, MIDI 1.0. Um, uh, Mike has already pointed out that there is a negotiation with MIDI CI. So um, if a device wants to do MIDI 2.0, it starts up in MIDI 1.0 and then um, asks the other MIDI device that is connected to it, do you support MIDI 2.0? And if both devices support it and they want to switch, they, they, they can then switch. Um, it um, usually also needs to um, sort of test that the switch worked fine, and then if that has succeeded, then they're both in MIDI 2.0 mode. Otherwise, they fall back to MIDI 1.0. Uh, for devices that support uh, MIDI 1 and MIDI 2, um, say they have a MIDI DIN connector, but also a MIDI 2 connector, whatever form that might be, um, th uh, we have defined a, a strict set of translation rules uh, so that um, devices connected to the MIDI 1 port can talk to MIDI 2 devices and vice versa. So um, that default translation set is sort of mandatory for, um, for a translation, so the translation is always the same. We have defined translation rules for every MIDI message uh, MIDI 1 and MIDI 2 and how they translate to each other. And um, of course, there are some MIDI 2 messages that do not translate back to MIDI 1, so they are just not translated. Per note control change cannot be translated to MIDI 1, so the default translation set is to not translate it. Um, in addition to the default translation set, a device can opt to have a, an alternate translation mode that can be switched to, and that alternate translation can then have specific or custom translations for how to deal with, uh, for example, per note uh, control, which could be translated to MIDI 1.0 MPE, for example. But maybe there are other ways or some custom SysX um, that you want to do. So it is possible, but um, there's a default translation that makes it makes it also the uh, the translation experience very consistent across devices. So here you can see a default translation for channel voice messages. 
uh, from MIDI 2 to MIDI 1. Uh, it might look more complicated than it is. It's just a bit of shifting and take the, the high bits of the 32 bits uh, data value and um, then you're basically done. <coughs> when translating um, MIDI 2 to MIDI 1, you need, of course, uh, also uh, care about the, the, the values because values in MIDI 2 are generally 16 or 32 bits and, and not 7 bits as in MIDI 1.0. So going back from a high resolution value to a low resolution value is quite simple. It's the right one here. Uh, it's just a bit shift. So we cut off the low bits. Uh, for going from MIDI 1 to uh, MIDI 2, from 7 bits to, say, 32 bits, oh, the, the example is 16 bits. Well, um, it's a bit more complicated because um, we want to um, go from min to min and max to max, so value, seven, uh, value 0 should be translated to value 0, but also value 127 should be translated to the 16-bit uh, maximum, which is 65,000, whatever. <laughs> um, and another particular thing about MIDI is that um, since you have a, a range of 0 to 127, um, there is no exact center. So by different definition, in MIDI 1.0, the center is 64, uh, which is off by a half. And um, so this algorithm takes that into, into account um, by using a different um, upscaling algorithm for the first half than for the second half um, to provide a relatively smooth um, translation of values from, from MIDI 1.0 to MIDI 2. Last but not ne least, uh, for compatibility, uh, how to deal with groups. Um, as Mike said, um, MIDI 2.0 or, or the U UMP packet um, provide 16 groups, and in every group, 16 channels. So um, the way how to translate that is to come up with uh, virtual MIDI cables, uh, or um, if you have a hardware device that might be uh, additional MIDI ports, or um, uh, in general, uh, MIDI 2 group gets translated to a MIDI 1 port. All right. That concludes my portion, and I welcome Brett on stage. Thanks, Florian. So the American boxing champ Mike Tyson once said, everybody's got a plan until they take a punch to the face. And in the same kind of way, a new protocol like MIDI 2.0 is really cool and awesome until you're the guy that has it dropped on his desk and somebody says, make it work, and there's no tooling, there's no language support, there's no nothing yet. Uh, so about 18 months ago, I was invited to join a prototype typing group in the MMA to uh, take the early drafts as they were developed and start building out things that would be useful to developers in the future. And the, the end version of that is everything that the prototyping group has been working on is eventually going to be available on the MMA's GitHub. Um, stay tuned for details on that. Uh, so what I've been focused on for the last 18 years as part of this is building tools that I would wish have existed when somebody dropped the standard doc on my desk in a year. And what that basically is boiled down to is a, a thing that I call MIDI 2.0 scope. And this is just a really simple juice utility that can build any MIDI 2.0 channel voice message I uh, can receive and decode any MIDI 2.0 channel voice message, including telling you if there are errors in it. And then it has, I'm, I'm realizing I'm at, I'm at ADC and I'm about to show you the world's worst MIDI sequencer, so stay tuned. Um, so this is the main view for the transmit screen. So drop down at the top for any of the 16 message types that are defined in MIDI 2.0, and then any of the attributes and parameters that can be set for each of message type uh, can be configured on there. Hit the send button, it generates the message, sends it out to whatever's at the other end. Um, exactly like you want to have if you're building a receiver device and you need to be able to, under controlled circumstances, send it something so you can verify that you behave correctly. Um, and something we've kind of danced around a little bit, there's a bunch of new message types. 
Um, Mike and, and Florian have already talked about some of them, the, the per note controllers registered and assigned, uh, plain old, you know, channel-wide RPN and RPN. Two new ones that are very cool if you manufacture gear that has uh, like shaft encoders, relative RPN and NRPN, so there, there's no nulling problem in the UI anymore. It, it's uh, signed, signed data that can be applied to the last thing, which is very cool. Uh, per note pitch bend has been talked about before. Then the bunch of MIDI 1.0 messages in the middle that are basically as, as you already know them, plus the, the benefits that Mike has added. And then down at the bottom, a new one, which is per note management, which I think it's gonna take a while for the industry to figure out what to do with that. Um, it allows you to control very carefully the lifetime of the connection between a controller and a node event, uh, which turns out to be a lot more complicated than you might think. And this is just a quick pick of uh, setting up a program message, program change message, and sending it. Just everything is displayed in hex as the, the values are changed on the UI. And so you switch over to the receive tab, a nice human readable description of what that was as it was sent on the other screen. Or if you're receiving from a prototype device that you're working on, it will decode what you, you're seeing there. Uh, we also have as part of that on the send version, uh, as I said, the world's worst MIDI sequencer, which allows you to define a bunch of channel voice messages in a file and send them out repeatedly, either at uh, standardized time durations or you know, per note time, time durations. And that can just be looped so that you can annoy your, your office mates with uh, you know, whichever. And that's driven by the world's dumbest ASCII text format. So it's a number of milliseconds in the first column, followed by hex bytes for whatever MIDI 2.0 message you want to fit in there. And that will support any of the defined messages. And then doing that back on a time basis will show you exactly what you would expect to see. Or you can intermix the raw hex with it so you can s compare hex values to what the human decoded ones were. And the one that's proven kind of useful, uh, a bunch of companies were working doing prototyping for the last year and a half or so. Uh, it detects any errors in the messages. So many of the channel voice messages have bits that you're not allowed to touch. So if any of them happen to be set, and this is obviously I'm verifying each one of those that they actually do work when they say there's an error. So that's the MIDI 2.0 scope. And as a side benefit of that, one thing that's inside of there, I've written a juice-friendly C++ class that implements uh, the MIDI 2 message standards. And uh, implements all the MIDI 2, this says channel voice messages, but it actually has support for all of the MIDI 2.0 messages. Packages a juice user module so you can just drop it into an existing project already and a very permissive license, we hope. The next steps to come out of that uh, obviously, if we can drive MIDI data to devices uh, on a deterministic basis, um, it's a logical thing to build a conformance test out of that. So one of the things that's on my plate soon is building that, that, that test app so that a manufacturer can sit down with a set of predefined tests that the MMA will define and say, do I implement MIDI 2.0 correctly or not? Uh, I need to add MIDI CI support in the, the MIDI 2 code base. That's on the way. And at some point, that will become available from the MMA GitHub. Uh, and I also want to represent a tool written by one of our uh, collaborators in the prototyping group. This is a MIDI CI workbench, uh, which there are two versions of. This one is an online version uh, that uses Web MIDI to test and prototype MIDI CI, lets you pull down all the profiles and property exchange details, and lets you visualize and debug the SysX traffic that's going across there. And I know we're running out of tra time, so I'm going to scream through this a little bit. And uh, just some, some looks at that. There's a connecting to FM6, and you can see a little bit about how it's pulling down uh, the program list that is in there through property exchange. Uh, this is kind of a cool experimental feature where he's using uh, uh, property data coming back to build on the fly a simple UI for a six operator FM synth with, with no programming involved. It just builds that on its own. Uh, since that version was released, Andrew has done a standalone Electron MIDI CI workbench that implements the standard more widely based on UMP internally and gives you a complete test and record facility for the device under test. And I'll just scream through those because I know we want to get a few questions. And I'll turn back to Mike. All right, so uh, just a couple of things. Uh, specifications are fundamentally done for MIDI 2.0. Technical design is done. 
Um, documents are in uh, really a document review process before they're published. So coming real soon to a store near you uh, or a website near you. Uh, will be one of these two, uh, the, the websites, oh, I'm looking at the next slide, okay. That's weird. Uh, more video problems. Uh, in order to use MIDI 2.0, a system exclusive uh, ID is required. And so you can contact the uh, MIDI Manufacturers Association or the Association of uh, Music Electronics. Um, and I think that's it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't, do we have a couple minutes for questions? Okay. Any questions? Put up your hand, somebody will bring you a mic. All the way up to the top there. There's a couple of questions up the top. Come on, Hello. Here, <laughs> so my question is, um, for synthesizers that uh, can play polyphonic uh, expression, there is already MP, and how does this relate to the MIDI 2.0 uh, per note controller? Well, the per note controllers allow you to do many or most of the things that MPE can do, but do it on a single MIDI channel. It's not a complete replacement for MPE, so there may be some reason for MPE to continue. Um, even if you've got MIDI 2.0 with, with per note controllers, there may be a reason to use MPE, but probably you are able to do, you know, 90% for a, a lot less effort, 90% of what MPE does. So they'll both, both continue to exist, or MP will continue while we add these new features. Another question, same, same row up there. So um, maybe this is a follow-up to what he just asked, but with MPE, you can uh, have overlapping notes, so one note number with uh, per note controller changes for each note independently. Is that possible somehow with uh, MIDI 2? Yeah, that's where we get into the, the per note management message, which is designed for exactly that. So in, uh, when you're using that, instead of using the MIDI note number in the note on and off messages to indicate the actual MIDI key number, that field is used as an index. And it's you know, monoton well, not necessarily monotonically increasing, but it, it's a meaningless number other than it's an ID for this note event. So you can hold down two, two Cs, and they'll be assigned different uh, note IDs, and then the per note controllers can attach to those events, and they're completely independent events until the per note management message detaches. And uh, to add to that, uh, with the pitch uh, controller, per note pitch controller, you can also have the same uh, sort of pitch, or, or the, you play the same note twice, and then change the pitch and go back to, to it as you as you Right, play. so the note number in that per note control message would be that mes event ID, not the, the MIDI key number. Yeah. Last question. So, I mean, clearly uh, MIDI 2 is uh, very much dependent on a uh, bi-directional link between uh, the two, um, two endpoints. When we talk about a DAW environment where the DAW is kind of an endpoint, but then the plugins within it are also kind of virtual endpoints in their own right. But then there's also a lot of dynamic updating. You know, as you're say in Logic, you have your MIDI typically your MIDI input typically connected to your focused yeah, track, sure. and as you update tracks, you've got a different plugin that's now the endpoint. Yes. Uh, how are things sort of intended to work in that type of a scenario? Uh, I think we can leave a lot to the DAW manufacturers to decide their own implementation of that, but in many cases, the DAW is going to act as a proxy for plugins, I believe. And so the, the DAW will inform other devices when a plugin changes, say, for example, it changes from an electric piano, like a Rhodes plugin, to a Hammond organ plugin. Uh, the DAW w will declare that the Rhodes uh, profile is now disabled and that an organ profile is enabled. So uh, the DAW can, can play that role uh, if it wants, or the DAW can just choose to send on all inquiry messages to whatever endpoint. So whichever track is active, 
uh, on that plugin is active, then you're talking to that one. It, it really is up to the DAW manufacturer to decide that. And either way is, is possible. And, and every, there are pros and cons. Everyone should be sure to come to the Steinberg session tomorrow, which is going to be about MIDI 2 and yep. VST3. So. Yeah. The, the, yeah, they'll be presenting some of how, how uh, Steinberg sees that happening uh, in, their, in their platforms. So I think we're done for time. Uh, unfortunately, we'll be outside. I know you're going to mob us. Uh, Thorian's signing autographs. Um, and, and then drop by upstairs. Uh, MIDI Manufacturers Association has a table in the back of the room up there. Uh, come and see us up there and ask, ask more questions. Thank you for your time today. Awesome. Thanks.